Uh, I'm introducing a speaker we have here. I kind of lucked out in this situation. There was a guy I was talking to online, a geneticist or a breeder. I'm not even sure what the proper terminology is, but a guy named Ryan Lee. Um, I wanted to have someone speak at this event who's directly involved with the breeding of plants and found this guy on Twitter and he seemed to know his stuff and I tried to do a little Googling, I couldn't find anything uh, aside from some really underground sort of forums of like these hardcore like older California dudes and they were just really singing his praises pretty hard so I was like, sweet, his name is Ryan Lee, uh, he was totally psyched to do it, something came up, he couldn't and then he actually asked this gentleman to fill in for him, Mr. Lewis, who is a PhD and works in cannabis. So in essence, I, I leveled up without even trying. Uh, Easter egg. Yes, Easter egg. Uh, Ryan, Ryan Lee hit me back like, he, he literally said, you're gonna fucking love me. Uh, so I'm pretty psyched. Um, and he sings your praises and everything I've seen on the internet sings your praises. So I'm curious as to what you're gonna talk about. Cool. I just am gonna riff. I only had a couple weeks to put anything together, and I didn't really put anything together. Just copied and pasted from the internet, and then wove into an existing, uh, you know, presentation. But Ryan Lee, um, it's interesting. So, uh, just a little bit about me. I have an undergraduate in chemical engineering and a PhD in natural products chemistry, and I've been cultivating cannabis since Dr. Dre's album, The Chronic Drops. <laughs> Uh, back then, we didn't have the internet, we had television, and more importantly, in my age group, we had M television, which that told you what was cool. And as soon as I saw dudes throwing joints, and I was like, I want to sell weed, that's, girl, girls are going to like that one day. And uh, lo and behold, I got very lucky, very serendipitous pathway, but back to Ryan Lee, we have all these new people coming into this industry, and... Um, because there's money now, right? And, and, and there's, uh, there's this legal climate that allows for it. And a lot of the pioneers, like Ryan, get pushed to the wayside and the new people don't even know who the ones who've laid the foundations for this whole industry and culture are. And it's kind of a bummer because, you know, uh, Ryan and I's generation is like that generation that was before computing, so to speak, and we're kind of like the link back to before people can create their own little catfish and their own little stories to say who started what. But Ryan has been friends with a, a, a guy named David Watson for a long, long time. And David Watson actually went country to country in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s getting cannabis seeds before there were biopiracy bio laws. So Ryan has had a really interesting view into how the entire seed industry um, began in the 80s and then blossomed to the 90s and what happened to cannabis genetics and seeds throughout those years. It's a whole different story that he can tell. But it was a, it was a blessing meeting him and it's a blessing being here because any, any way I can educate anyone on this particular topic is rewarding for me because I want everyone to be prepared for what's going to happen in the future. And it's going to be a lot different than it is today. i just tell you that. The title of this talk is Hacking Plants to Hack Humans. So basically what people don't realize a lot is that there's something called the central dogma of molecular biology. This is just going to be super high, top level. And when I was getting my PhD, it was focused on nucleic acids. So I was kind of a nucleic acids chemist, right? I, I worked with DNA, site selective binding based on sequence. The central dogma of molecular biology is essentially saying that you know, you have DNA, it makes a copy of itself, which is an RNA, and that RNA makes a translational copy of itself into proteins, right? General rule, but what's really trippy about that is that this is a computer. The nucleus is your CPU, the cells your UI, the DNA is your hard drive. The reason it's double-stranded is because it's a backup. Like, it's a built-in, burnt backup, essentially. And uh, as this gets chugged away, it's a literally a base-for-base base copy to make an RNA. And that messenger RNA then becomes a protein. Right, there's all kinds of weird numerology shit I can pull into this too. I mean, with the, the hexagrams and the... It, it's it's kind of trippy how it all works together and that we based our computing model almost perfectly after it with the hard drive. The, the RNA would be comparable to your RAM, the program to your protein. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting, that whole 
central dogma. And while I was getting my PhD, it was when people, they were saying that, you know, rats and humans have about the same number of genes. But the difference between them, from a genome perspective, was the amount of space between the genes and the DNA. And they said that was all junk DNA, and they used to call it non-coding DNA. Now we're realizing that that space was actually the instruction booklet on how to build something with those same amount of genes. So essentially the rat has the same amount of genes as us, but our instruction booklet's way more complex. They're like Ikea, and we're like German or something. Like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's that. And what's interesting about this is that a protein is what makes the chemicals in a plant. So when you think about it in terms of breeding, and being able to hack the genome. There's all kinds of technologies. I'm sure you've heard of uh, transgenesis where, you know, Monsanto has used a type of algae, algae bacteria and it actually goes into the cell and uh, puts inserts a little bit of DNA and they, they, they transgene things like Roundup Ready, and, you know, a gene that makes it, you know, doesn't die when Roundup is sprayed on it. Um, and this is, this is cool for plants that we actually have mapped out their genome, but for cannabis, it, it's pretty far off still. Um, this is still like science fiction. In our world, we use conventional plant breeding, where we use uh, one plant and we'll, we'll, we'll make it breed with itself, and that informatic process lends itself to segregations and populations. So if maybe you want high THC every time you breed, you breed high THC, high THC, high THC, that's what the marketplace has done for the past 20 years, you get high THC. So, but that causes problems in the genome when you try to back that information out. Um, and one, uh, in a very interesting thing is they, they sequenced the cannabis genome just a, you know, about eight, nine years ago for the first time, and they discovered a gene that's called olive tolic acid cyclase. May not seem very in intriguing, but it was, that same enzyme is in bacteria, uh, streptomyces, and we use that bacteria to make very complex anti-cancer drugs, and then we brew it like beer and purify it, and then we take those drugs. And what this common enzyme is telling us is that we can totally hijack this cannabis genome and custom make chemicals in it, right? And then those chemicals translate directly back to a sequence of DNA. So if you look at on the far left, uh, right hand side for you guys, the, the little double helix across the top is essentially your DNA of the cannabis plant. And as you go down, those are different uh, uh, enzymes that are producing different chemicals. And these are present in every cannabis plant, but the cannabis that you buy today only produces mostly THC and sometimes CBG. And I'm saying the neutral form is really THCA and CBGA, but that makes it even more complicated than it really is because the acid forms on the plant don't get you high. So if you eat that raw bud, you're not gonna get stoned. But if you take that raw bud and throw it in the oven at 100 degrees for about an hour and eat it, you're gonna go on a trip because that Delta-9, when you eat it versus inhaling, gets passed through your liver and gets converted to something called 11-hydroxy THC, which is actually a, about 100 times stronger binder than regular THC. So as you can see already with cannabis, there's like so many different compounds and ways to manipulate it that it, when you're ingesting it or putting it into your body, you don't know what the, the effects are right now. It's like downloading a file off the internet that says do not open, you open it anyway to see what the fuck, what's gonna happen? <laughs> but to add to this complexity, and like I mentioned, there's, there's, there's things like CRISPR, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's where you can go in and either delete a gene or insert a gene, and they just saw you know that cells were doing this to keep track of what viruses infected it, but, that's still so far off for cannabis. Because we can't even take a cannabis plant down to a totipotent cell, or callus, or stem cell, whatever you want to call it, and then grow a plant back out. That technology does not exist. So you can't begin to do CRISPR until you know how to do the other, and you know we're probably looking at 10 years before we see any real research articles on that. But instead, some people focus on regular plant breeding, which when you're breeding for a plant, you have to isolate traits. And I'm just gonna zip through this because people don't really realize that there are five classes of active compounds in cannabis. You have cannabinoids, you have terpenoids, you have low molecular weight volatiles, 
you know, fatty acids, and then you have all of the phytosteroids and estrogens, right? So all these things can be active, and you can target to breed for them. So what you get when you go to the dispensary today is really like monochrome. It, 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 it's before any technology has taken place. It, it, it's, it's truly like hard computing compared to where we are today. Um, and just to give you an idea of the number of uh, chemicals and stuff that we select for and look for in breeding, here's a sample of, you know, uh, across the top here, the orange bar is your total essential oil content and the green bar is your total cannabinoid content. We have other bar graphs that set on top of this for when we're selecting a breeding class that show you THC amount, CBD amount, propyl cannabinoid, CBG amount, so that we can target individual traits, keep breeding, and basically just taking little copies of that gene and putting as many of them on the allele as we can so that when it gets expressed, it makes a shit ton of chemical, right? That's how you get your high THCA plants, and that's how you can breed up your terpenes, and that's what these color-coded things are down here at the bottom. Interesting little factoid is we were the first people to ever color code terpenes. Everyone in the industry wanted to color code cannabinoids. And I was like, wait, the terpenes would give it the smell. Why wouldn't you color code those? It'd be like a bouquet. And another thing, culture miseducates you, misinforms you, okay? Stronger isn't better. Holding your hip longer doesn't get you higher. It's, it's, those are facts, right? But indica and sativa don't exist. It's not a real taxonomic nomenclature. It's a factoid of culture. People want to hear sativa, they want to hear indica, they want to hear hybrid, but the truth is because of prohibition, every plant is a hybrid. So if you look at the chemistry, the chemistry will tell you what effects it gives you. And these color-coded bars are different terpenes, like green is pinene, yellow is limonene, red is terpenoline, and we color-coded them so that the warm colors give you the more stimulating sativa-like effects, and the cool colors give you more sedative, sedative um, uh, you know, indica-like effects. So, just want to show you this so you understand, there's 17 key terpenes that people select for, we scan for 80, there's about 13 cannabinoids that people select for, uh, we, we do about 30, and 99%, which I'll get to in a moment, is all THC in the marketplace. So, how do you create an endocannabinoid system, that's what ECS means, uh, hacking toolkit. It's interesting because when, when you think about this and you look at cannabis in the marketplace, everybody wants that THC, but that's one signal, one effect. You can modulate it with dosage a little bit and sometimes with the terpenoids, um, but it really gets it gets crazy when you, when you look at cannabis. And our, our one big innovation in the past 20 years has been more and more potent cannabis by THC measurement. In 1996, they did a study that looked at all cannabis users, and they use this word cannabis. It's like so generic. It's like Smurf. Um, but, but you don't ever hear a doctor prescribe poppy. Here's some, take some poppy. No, you, they produce, they, they, they'll, they'll write it for codeine for cough, they'll write it for morphine for pain, iscapine for anti cancer, but never poppy. But cannabis is cannabis. But this study showed that back in 1996, about 20% of recreational users reported adverse effects like anxiety, paranoia. Ah. Same study, 2002, about 40% of people. And if you extrapolate that out to today, a lot of people are going to experience adverse events because of the potent high THC cannabis. And I, granted, I liked high, high THC cannabis until until walking around like 10 acre grows and having a family and like being like, oh fuck, they're coming to get me. Like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Get out of here! You should have smoked that train wreck, man. <laughs> I literally like quit smoking weed for you know a couple of years until I developed things that were way better. Um, but it's really cool because today we can look at the the ECS toolkit as I call it, and it's very monochromatic. It's mostly high. THC, very few terpenoids, which those are your flavor, your scent, your aroma, and there's usually only one kind of, uh, well, two kinds of CBD flower on the marketplace. It's either a, a one part THC, two part CBD, and then it's high myrcene, which just tastes yucky and doesn't give you a good effect. It's kind of like bleh. And then you have the all CBD plants, which those are like bleh, which are even worse. Um, so. When you look at the things, 
the marketplace, like I said, again, I keep hitting this home. Right now, 98% of all plants are high THC. That, that, that's no diversity. If someone comes in and has never used cannabis and they use it, they're not going to like it, potentially. And then they want to try something else, they're not going to like that. It's the same, right? So it's very hard to know what the future is going to be like, because today it's just monochromatic. And if you look at some of the things we put together, we have every combination accessible. Not only for researchers, but also for different uh, you know, dispensary entities and different supply chains that we help uh, uh, manage. And the overwhelming response is that they love THC a little more than CBD with a very loud terpene nose, depending if they want to be more in like the, the, the focus creativity range or they want to go the other way and rest and relax. They, they do both. And then varying the ratios of the different cannabinoids, you can actually help mitigate pain and then coupled with the right terpenoids, people don't even realize that black pepper has beta caryophyllene in it. It's a major essential oil. And it's a CB2 agonist, which means it's a cannabinoid, but it's produced by black pepper. Well, most cannabis has beta caryophyllene in it, which works as a CB2 agonist. And we found that if you co-administer beta caryophyllene with CBD, you can increase the efficacy of the CBD by 100 times at a much lower dosage by tweaking that ratio. So there's all these little games you can play to mess with your own metabolome, and I've done enough of that. I don't know. You keep going or not? But why do you want to do that? Well, the, the 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 work has been laid out by Dr. Ethan Russo. He tells us the tale of two cannabinoids, where if you take THC and co-administer with CBD, it will kind of it will delay the onset of the THC, and then it will prolong the effect. So what we like to say is it's a gentle ride up and a nice glide down. But if you don't have enough THC to overcome the CBD, which is the, the case for almost all CBD medicine in the marketplace, you don't ever get that euphoria that you're looking for. So if you have a high THC user and they're smoking something with CBD in it, most of the time they get grumpy because they're, they're looking for that chemical reward. They want that boom. And they're just like, man, I need to get high. You know? Which is not always the reason to consume cannabis. It might be to chill out or whatever. More recently, uh, Russo wrote a paper with me where we explored um, the tandem cannabinoid and terpenoid interactions. We actually look at uh, propyl cannabinoids in this paper as well. Um, but to kind of bring it home to why, the hows and the whys, this is your, your neuron synaptic cleft, right? The big signals are going to hit at the head of that cleft, whether it's dopamine, capsaicin, opioids, whatever. And the endocannabinoid system is kind of the tuning system. It says, hey, we're about to send a signal. Hey, we just received a signal. And that tuning is really, really, uh, the, found, the, the discoverer of THC actually says that the endocannabinoid system shapes your personality and, and, and can tell you what you like, who you are, those types of things. And it's interesting because if you look at the FDA uh, recent data for CBD, it, the, there was a, against placebo, a 10x increase in aggression and anger when CBD alone was administered. Um, similarly, another compound that targeted the endocannabinoid system back in the, the, the 80s and 90s was called Ramonabon. It was a diet pill. It was fucking awesome. People lost weight like nobody's business. And then they released it to the public, and those some pe same people started killing themselves. Because not only did it kill the reward for eating, it killed the reward for seeing your loved ones, for doing something good, and for life itself. So the, although the endocannabinoid system is a tuning system, there are lots of hypotheses that this is actually what shapes your personality and can help uh, mood elevation quite a bit, right? So I want to take a practical example um, of just, just anxiety, because it's an easy one for me, because that was why I didn't use cannabis for a while. I was always getting like, is that, is that done? You know, they're like, oh man, I got a picture on my phone at 4 a.m. of like, what was it, Fruit Blast, some video game. I'm like, oh, who hacked my phone? To find out my kid's using her iPad that's synced with my phone. I'm just like, God, I got problems. <laughs> it's crazy. But, uh, so just take a glimpse into a cannabis journey. In, my, in this story, this is where I talk about Samantha. She's a a real patient that is personified by multiple patients that I've worked with over the years. And, and um, 
It always started with a doctor back in the day. It doesn't have to. But the doctor always says, just try cannabis. Just try to stay away from smoking it, because, you know, inhaling things is bad for you, blah, blah. So, you know, she gets all excited, and she's like, oh, I'm going to go to the dispensary. Boom. And she goes to buy edibles, right? And she's like, cool, I'm going to get some edibles. And even today, the labeling on edibles, they, the regulators make you put it in weight percent. And that does nothing for the user. Like, you know, some people, some edible manufacturers actually have the milligram dosage on it or whatever. And as you heard from the microdosing uh, nurse earlier, it's good to start low and slow. You know, always wait a half hour. But unfortunately, that's not the case for a lot of people. They just grub them things down and they taste so good today that you can't taste it. You're like, oh, there's nothing in this. And before you know it, like seriously, it's like freaking out. And I, this is the most common thing. And the best thing for this is a CBD only e pen. It will serve as a rescue. It will get right in there and start disrupting that THC binding in the system. So if you have someone who's freaking out, get them a CBD e pen, they'll be safe. But it, this is really funny because a, a doctor from Kaiser actually uh, went to a dispensary and she wanted to try an edible because she was, she was recommending it to her patients. And uh, I got a phone call at like 8.30 p.m. and it's the dispensary going, hey, this doctor wants to talk to you really badly. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, she came to the dispensary wearing a tennis skirt. I was like, yeah, whatever. But she was literally on her kitchen floor painting on her wall with mustard and said that was the only thing that would calm her down. And I was like, keep painting, break up the ketchup. You know? <laughs> it's crazy. True story. Can't wait till the movie. Uh, but what happens then is the person's like, whoa, I can't trust an edible because she'd buy the same thing twice back then and it would, you know, one would be okay and the next one would like send her to the moon. Um, and she wants to try flowers and like all the, oh my gosh, you got Dookie Shoes OG Kush, you got wedding cake, pie, crust, you don't even, I mean, every name you can imagine, right? So it's overwhelming for people most of the time and when there's only THC in the marketplace, it's mostly myrcene dominant, which myrcene is your couch lock terpene. Um, but it smells like berries, and that's why people select it so much over the years, and it's kind of sweet. Uh, kind of disappointed Samantha, so she went back on her Paxil and her Fexor, which she did, she did not like those things. But then this, uh, this, 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 this whole cycle, you know, made her so disillusioned that she didn't want to mess with cannabis anymore, right? Until there, there was this one guy who just broke cannabis open to the whole world. All of a sudden, people were like, holy shit, CBD can cure everything. And uh, that was kind of the thing. So, you know, Samantha comes back and she's like, hey dude, I want to try this again. And then, let's, let's learn about it. Let's, let's figure out where to find CBD. And, you know, even to this day, you can only find, like I was, this monochromatic CBD that is you know, one step away from hemp. It doesn't have the flavor profile of the OG or the, you know, train wreck or whatever it is that you, you like. It might be wedding cake, um, but those are verse to, um, you know, commitment. I don't like wedding cake as much. Um, but th th this gave her a new hope. And again, it ended unsatisfactorily because, like I said, the dominant terpene is CBD. CBD is myrcene uh, in flowers that contain CBD. So th what happens is it's this really blah feeling. And you don't have that, you know, if you walk into a house blindfolded and it smells like lemons and, I mean, just like fresh food, you, you have this vision in your house that it's clean, you know? If you open your eyes and it was like totally dirty in a shithole, you'd be like, whoa, that, that like just totally mind messed me, you know? And similarly, if you walked in someplace blindfolded and it smelled like dog and cat and feces and you open it, it was like spotless mansion, it would kind of twist you. The same thing with this. If you're... If you're doing something that's supposed to be enjoyable and it tastes horrible or it's harsh, that's going to start the, the negative impact of that. Because THC is an entheogen, a mild entheogen, right? It, it, it strips your, your ego away and kind of does this weird pseudo-psychedelic effect. And um, it's probably the what reason why, why, I don't know if you know this or not, but THC is one of the few molecules that rats won't self-administer. Because, you know... Uh, strips the ego away and makes a face for demons. You're like, well, that shit's heavy. <laughs> I was strung out on like alcohol and cocaine like two months ago. These damn cages. 
it's funny. It's true though. It's like it's so true because I know we've all been there. Like uh, even if it's just something as like two sentences in the email, you're like, shit, that came off kind of harsh. You gotta get over it. Anyway, again, frustration. She uh, she's over. So that's 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 where we kind of start building tools for purposeful use. And the, and the first thing you realize is that there's too many molecules in this stuff. And, and how do you create a, a report format or a label that people can look at for a flower or an e-pen that can kind of convey what's in it and what's going to do to you? So we had a dispensary owner who said that she would love it if we could help her figure out how to understand test results because she did not understand them at all. And so we developed something called the Phytofax, which is essentially a report format, as mentioned, um, that has the common name here, uh, and the top three terpenes are color coded up here. There's you know total cannabinoids, total terpenes, and the moisture content. Uh, more importantly, we, we create a classification system that basically sorts the cannabis by chemistry, so that it puts things in classes. Whether it's whatever common name you want to put on it, you know I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the further things move across eastward. It becomes this thing of, hey, what, what are your two favorite strains again, bro? And you're like, OG Kush and Bubba. Oh, this is OG Cross Bubba. And it doesn't matter what it is, they're just trying to sell it, right? But this is how you destroy the name game, and that was our whole challenge. Um, there's a little ratio dial here that shows you the ratio. Black is THC, and gray in this case is uh, CBGA. Um, there's uh, aroma and flavor uh, with some pictures to help people understand. This was going to be a little spicy and sweet. And then there's an effects dial that uh, basically predicts the entourage effects of the terpenes as they're superimposed onto the pharmacology of the, the, the cannabinoids. But remember, if you're taking a super huge cannabinoid blast, you're going to feel that way over any terpene entourage. But if you're, as you co-administer CBD with the THC, it actually brings out the terpenoid entourage, which is one of the, the things that we discovered. Oops, sorry, go back. Um, so then you have the terpene profile down here. Again, I mentioned cooler tones are more indica-like sedative effects. This is the perps, uh, and the warmer tones are uh, in more sativa-like effects. So, you know, like everyone, Samantha's favorite cannabis is an OG Kush. This is an OG Legend. An OG Legend is mostly uh, limonene, this yellow bar here, with some beta caryophylline and some linalool. Um, it kind of smells like lemons and strawberries and stuff, and it gives you this host of uh, initial energy and then a, a coasting uh, high there. And it's mostly THC with some CBG, 27% cannabinoids. So this is going to give her the anxiety that, you know, she doesn't like so much. So how could we modify this, the chemistry of this plant to make it more um, friendly for someone who doesn't like a type 1? Oh, the truth comes out. Samantha's, I am also Samantha. Um, but I figured for the mostly male audience, Samantha would be better than my open mug. Uh, so what we call purposeful use, right? We want something that's going to get us high, make us happy, not, not, not freak us out too much. This is about a one-to-one -one THC to CBD. Um, again, same terpene profile, limonene, caraphylene, and little oil. Same flavor, so it smells, has a real dank OG nose. But it doesn't get you quite as freaked out. It still gets you stoned. It's just safer. I mean, there, there's been paper after paper in the past four years that show chronic high THC use causes hippocampal harm and does a whole host of things to um, your, your brain. And it's important for us to realize that when 18 to 25 year olds whose brains aren't fully developed are doing dabs, that's shit we've never seen before in history. So who's going to cover their Medicaid bill? I mean, seriously. And if you just co-administer a little CBD with the THC, it totally mitigates all of the adverse effects. It's just totally amazing. Um, plenty of papers on that. Reach out to me if you want to see some of that research. I can certainly provide it. Um, but even this was a little iffy for Samantha and myself when I'm touring a grow. Uh, but if we got something that's mostly CBD here, but there's a little THC, but more importantly, you have the high limonene and the beta caryophylline. Now that's a good stone and it lasts for a long time. I mean, really long time, like three hours because of the, the slow onset THC. It just keeps coming. It's very interesting because the CBD actually uh, slows the metabolism of the THC in the body as well. Um, so I could be butchering some of this. I highly doubt it because I've 
been rooted in it. But today, we're here in our little XY graph. Um, I think that tomorrow we'll be up here and, and we're going to create more fun and more functional uh, cannabis. Um, Right now, it depends on time of day, it depends on what mood I'm trying to achieve, whatnot, but there's a lot of great products in the pipeline, and how to communicate what they're going to do to people is probably the most challenging thing, because this is like computers before Steve or whoever made it simple. This is like, holy shit, it's hard enough for me to think about just one compound. I mean, it'd be like going to the liquor store, and the only thing you can see about the product is alcohol percentage. That's it. You couldn't could see if it's a beer or if it's wine. It's true. I mean, especially when you have multiple uh, cannabinoids, you know, you have propyl, which is THCV, which is the same exact structure as THC with one carbon shorter side chain, which means it's just a slightly less strong binder to the same receptor. Same with CBD and CBDV. So one cultivar that a, a group grew last year is called Guava Jam. It was 6% CBDV, uh, about 8% CBD, and less than 0.5% THC. And it, I mean, there's a obvious pronounced effect that's not a THC stone. It's, it's, it was like a mixture between really strong espresso and nicotine. Like it, 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 it's very interesting how these different ratios, they still have pronounced effects. It's just not, oh, I'm, I'm getting stoned. It's, oh, I'm doing something for a reason. You know, I have a guy who runs ultras. Yeah, that's control. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, in a perfect world, we'd all be in like a, a sensory deprivation tank and get blasted a little alcohol when we wanted, a little stimulant when we wanted, a little THC when we wanted, and then the cycle goes round and round, so you're nice and inspired the whole time for your daily routine. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury today, maybe when we're in the matrix. But I have an ultra marathon runner friend who, I mean, he said, you know, I, I, he had some one-to-one -one high pining. Um, I mean, we're talking high pining, like we bred it up to like 3% in a single cultivar. Most cultivars don't even have 2% terpenes, period. Uh, and he, he said it was, it's the hands down, favorite thing for mountain biking and running ultras. Like he had knee surgery, so it mitigates the pain, stay focused, but he's not freaked out enough that he's afraid he's gonna ride off the cliff, you know what I'm saying? So th there's a lot of utility in creating chemistries around, it's like performance enhancing. It's not quite Adderall, but it, it could be that for some people, right? Yeah. you know, on a lot of levels. And, and that's what we're headed towards. We're headed towards figuring out ways to to make cannabis make us better, you know. And that's it, man. I just thought I'd share what I know. And you can feel free to ask any questions. We, we manage a ton of people, do a lot of work. So, like Paul Pocker said, my camera modulating the endocannabinoid system may have therapeutic potential for everything. Um, because it is the tuning system in the neuro, uh, in our CNS. So, um, yeah. yeah, man. Do you have any strains in uh, Vegas right now? What's a strain, bro? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I just strained myself on this microphone. <laughs> Uh, cultivar, chemovar is the word we like to use because strain is held for viral bacteria, stuff like that. Uh, again, this is that cultural impact, right? Like uh, I heard someone say that sativa was marked by high pinene, and it's actually not the case. High pinene doesn't exist in, in the marketplace. Very, It's very rare. Usually a pi pinene myrcene co-dominated. Co but um, no, not in Las Vegas, California and the East Coast. Um, how, how are you kind of I, like, reversing the, the decades of like hybridizing and creating just like extremely high THC and then essentially no... Right, so uh, yeah. basically I was very fortunate because I, I lived, I might have said this too early actually, I lived in a place that had one of two DEA permits to cultivate cannabis back in the 80s and 90s. And I happened to go to that university and just happened to stumble across a guy who worked in that greenhouse. So I had access to, by pure chance and serendipity, um, a lot of non, 
non-traditional, they're land race uh, varietals. And then obviously all you have to do is find one little blip and you can continuously inbreed out the bad and breed in the good. But it literally takes 12 to 20 generations depending. And a lot of cannabis breeders today don't have that type of patience. Nor the skill set, like, you know, because to be honest, it, when we started our laboratory, our only goal was non-smoking true chemists to hire. And it was, it was really difficult to find anybody worth a damn because they didn't want to touch it. You know, they had 401ks, they had, you know, they worked for pharma, they were getting paid, there's no reason for them to risk anything, right? And, and so, until recently, um, it's been a challenge to find great people in their field who aren't from the cannabis culture, if that makes sense. And then being able to find those people and plug them in. And if there's any coders here interested, I mean, we're, we're building our own software that actually creates those phytofacts and uses CRM data. We're always looking for great help and talent and guinea pigs and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's kind of the goal is to create a new paradigm that opens this up to everyone, right? I mean, it's not a bad goal. To, you know, my mission in life has been to learn as much as possible and educate as many as possible but also to get as many people to fire ass weed that I smoke as possible. Because I think that will help change our frequency of consciousness. Um, how often do you find people that are more interested, like it seems like yourself, in the psychological benefits of being able to make medicines that can affect people for intended purposes? I mean, like it seems like in the cannabis culture there's a lot of you know, the stoners and everything that do get it that bad name and everything, but um, are there enough people that are out there, you know, in the public um, that are as interested in those psychological effects? That Absolutely. I, you go you go five years ago, and uh, pardon the French, but CBDs for pussies, man. <laughs> and, and now, with recreation opening up, in particular in California, because that's where we see most of this, there's all these baby boomers coming in, and the first thing they say is, I don't want to get too high, man. I, I, I want to enjoy weed like I used to enjoy it. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like what, what we, our aim is, is to help people enjoy weed the, the way they used to enjoy it, but also for people who give a shit about their body and their brains, create things that make them better. I mean, they're therapies. It doesn't have to be medicine. I mean, I, I don't care if you say adult use or recreational or medical. It's all therapeutic because, you know, one of my... I have two, two, two sayings that are cool. One is, do you guys know what the largest demographic of pot users are? Any guesses? That's setting me up. It's the ones who haven't used it yet. Because only 10% of the population uses it. The other 90 are like, eh, it's fucking drugs, man. Right. Right. right? And then the other one is that what corn and rice did for humans to be able to sustain large city-states energetically, cannabis is going to help us do uh, consciously. Like, so we don't kill each other, you know, kind of tone us down a little bit, like, bring it down. Right. That and the psychedelics, obviously, which you can see on the front of my computer there. Yeah. <laughs> Support so, maps. So, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer as a benefit to humanity, you know, so what is it in the states particularly behind the scenes, you know, besides old congressmen and, you know, Jeff Sessions? Uh, What's the hold up? I, I am big not farm. a politician, man. Big farm. I don't even do good in big my farm. own office politics. So. <laughs> I mean, just so we can like move this forward quick. I would assume that it's the the people who are afraid of what happens when the ego goes away, right? Mm -hmm. Then people realize that they're flying drones or whatever. I don't right. know. I'm totally speculating. I have no opinion. No. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? So for, for those of us who aren't necessarily like uber coders, but we are really big proponents of the therapeutic effects and happen to live in states where it's legal, is there like a network that we can connect into to help get this information out? Because like there's dispensaries that I love that have no idea about anything you talked about in this you know, 40 minutes. I'd love to take them on as clients. We provide all kinds of consumer educational materials. So, I mean. Cool. I will come and get business cards from you. Okay. Great. <laughs>
Uh, I got here late, I'm sorry, but I do have a question. How how open are these dispensaries when you go talk to them? I mean, I've talked to a couple of dispensary owners and they're like, I'm making money like nobody's business, so I don't need any of that. It's interesting because uh, I, the, the ultra runner I was telling you about, I think one of his text messages was, I try, you know, now this rack, I call it a delivery company. And when you start talking about CBD, it's like talking to a wall. Because, uh, you know, like you said, there's it's a huge growth uh, growth industry, and it's kind of like the medical field was in the 90s. Everybody be, wanted to be a doctor or a nurse because there's a shortage. But what do you have now? A bunch of shitty doctors and nurses. So it's not... Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have an answer for that. I know. It's true, though. That's why I got into this field, was I watched how they, my dad was diagnosed with cancer, and I watched what the doctors told him. They flat out, he had digestive cancer, and they said it didn't matter what he ate. I was just like, are you guys dumb? I was like, what's going on? And then I started to be a physician, and then my mentor said, why be a mechanic when you can be an engineer? And then I was like, oh, that makes sense. Do things that really matters and not just put band-aids on people. Thank you for um, this awesome presentation. Um, I wanted to address your comment about the need for cannabis education. There's a group of educators out of uh, Portland, Oregon, and I'm one of them working together as open source materials on oh, this stuff and doing it. So, I'll talk with you after this, for sure. Thank you. No problem. Just it needs to get out. Yeah, yeah. and uh, as I told half of your board three weeks ago, I'd love to help. I would love that. Good. Good. Any other questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the invite. Thank you, Rex. You're the man.